former colleague from the state senate. Uh, uh, Kathleen really, you know, I've known her for what six, eight years now. Really, only has one kind of negative. We might as well get it out of the way right away, and that is that uh, she was raised in Illinois. <laughs> Uh, but Kathleen graduated from Aurora High School in Aurora, Illinois, and went on to Southern Illinois University to earn her bachelor's, and then went on, Dr. Weinhold, to a master's at St. Louis, uh, St. Louis University and her PhD at St. Louis University as well. And uh, went on to a teaching career on the faculty of the University of Illinois at Springfield. Wow. Uh, all of her work has been in health policy, health administration, and she headed up the graduate and undergraduate departments at, at the University of Springfield for about 10 years. But then the siren song of the fertile fields of uh, west central and northwestern Wisconsin called and her and her husband Doug came and Doug, a uh, former member of the Illinois House of Representatives, as many of you probably know, uh, went up to Alma to the family farm, 220 acres of paradise, where they had uh, uh, dairy cattle. And I, do you have cattle or cows anymore now, or is it all just, grain? Just horses. Grain full of horses. And what is it that they farm? They're active farmers, and it's a uh, it's an organic grain farm. But as all good farmers, when they moved up to Alma, they, uh, Kathleen got active civically on the Buffalo County Fair Association, active with the Farm Bureau, and then in 2005 was hired part-time to go do some political advocacy for the Farmers Union at all. Had to go to the Capitol in Madison. And I think that's maybe when it bit because she ran. In 2006, uh, she ran against Ron Brown, an incumbent state uh, senator, beat him. Thank you for that. But more, thank you in 2010 for being Ed Thompson. Uh, Kathleen has been a, a real uh, anchor in the Democratic Caucus, in leadership in the, uh, in the leadership in the Senate Democratic Caucus, and has uh, been a real uh, tremendous advantage in developing policy for the Democrats in the state Senate. Now, I know many in the Democratic Party and many in other Wisconsin say, oh, you know, complain from time to time. But we don't have anybody who can articulate our Democratic agenda and then go out and proselytize and convince people to support it. And worse, they, they, well, some people say we don't have enough of the Democratic agenda. All we do is complain about the Republicans and their ideas. And we need to have more Democratic policy that we can stand behind and work towards. Worse yet, some Democrats will say we don't have a candidate for governor in 2018. Well, I think once you hear Kathleen's presentation this afternoon, you'll see that she's a pretty convincing antidote to all three of those concerns. And so uh, I welcome uh, Kathleen here today. I'm sure all of you will too. And uh, once you get done with this presentation, see if you don't agree with me that I think she'd be a tremendous candidate for governor in 2018. Kathleen Weinstein. Well, thank you, Jim. I, I can't believe you memorized all those details about <laughs> my background. <laughs> More than anybody knows, I'm sure. I am here to help arm you with ammunition to prepare for the coming campaign season. You have to speak it. Can you hold it over? I certainly can. And it sounds like it's really hot now. <laughs> okay. I want to give you information and a way to talk about issues that can help the candidates that we're going to hear from a little bit later after we have um, a little break in the action. So tonight we have the room for about three hours and we're going to talk a little bit about what the folks running the Capitol don't want you to know about when it comes to the state budget and schools and our communities. And then we're going to take a break to get something to eat and to chat and to get a chance to see and, and shake hands with the candidates and then we're going to come back and we're going to have all the candidates give a very short speech, very, very short, and have an opportunity for you to ask, ask them at least a, a question or two. And we're going to give everybody an opportunity to hear from the people that are going to be on the ballot. It's been changing a lot, so it'll be kind of a surprise to see who the candidates are and what they're all running for. But I think that you'll be able to put some names with some faces by the time we're done. 
and hopefully my presentation here will give you some ideas on how to talk about what's happening in Madison in your own neighborhoods, in your own communities. And I'm going to start with schools. Schools are the heart of our community. Oh, can you hear that? You probably can't. That's kind of wake you up a little. As you know, schools are paid for with both property taxes and local taxes. There are many folks that wear the Republican label that will say to you, schools were our top priority, but we couldn't fund them because we didn't have any money. Well, this is the state budget, and those bar graphs are going up. And in fact, the one that's the most recent, the one budget we're in now, is $3 billion, that's billion with a B, over the last budget. And since Governor Walker and the Republicans took over, it's $7.5 billion with a B. This is a two-year budget, but you know what? A billion is a lot of money. So to say that they don't have the money to fund schools is just flat out wrong. This is what's happening to the funding of public schools. And there's a lot of games being played with numbers. And I had to work hard to get rid of all those private schools in the public school budget. You can see that something happened a few years ago that was not good for our children and grandchildren. Oh, you probably hear me. <laughs> All right, I don't know if you heard that, but it was an explosion. <laughs> and the explosion was Act 10. Remember the governor dropping the bomb? Well, that was the dropping of the bomb. And the dropping of the bomb, it created a really big hole. And so, oops, sorry. Going too fast here. That hole, when you hear Tom Tiffany say, oh, we made schools whole, well, to make them whole, you're going to have to fill that hole. And it's not being done. In fact, if you take this line and go back to where we were, we're at the level of about 2006, 10 years ago, in funding schools. These are some things that happened in the last budget. There's a little bit of a wonky term that they call the revenue limits. In, in Madison, and it means that the schools can't spend any more than that revenue limit, and it hasn't been changed in this budget, which means the state, folks at the state capitol that voted for the budget have capped the amount of money that our local schools can spend. Of course, everybody will tell you the costs are going up. We also see that there's a new program that went statewide. And that program takes money out of the public schools and gives it to private schools through something called a voucher. And that money is coming directly out of the student's budget for the public schools. So I don't know if Rhinelander has a, has a private school, private high school. No, but some of the bigger schools have a lot of problems because they're losing these dollars to the private schools. And in addition, something that costs, makes it harder for our schools to provide the services to students when students come to school in poverty. Here, dark red, these are numbers from DPI. And I have to tell you, all of my numbers here are nonpartisan. Most of them are from the nonpartisan fiscal bureau. Some of them are from the nonpartisan non audit bureau. These numbers are from the Department of Public Instruction. These are students in poverty as measured by free and reduced lunch. School year 2003-04 and the school year 13-14. The dark red, I know you can't read my little key up here, but the dark red is more than 70%. The, the medium red is 51 to 70%. The, Lighter red is 40 to 50 percent. The orange is 21 to 40 percent. And you can see how the north has totally changed. Now, if you're a teacher, you used to work in a school system, you know the kids that come to school that don't have internet at home, they don't have 
a parent to read to them. They don't have someone to help them get winter clothes or get enough to eat. All of these things make a difference for the school system. We know how to help children in poverty, and it's a simple answer. It means a grown-up that helps them. And so the more the teachers are strapped with bigger and bigger classrooms and fewer and fewer aids, the harder it is to help students in poverty. So just the opposite is happening that we would hope. We would hope these schools would have more resources, more people to help them, but instead they have fewer teachers. You will hear from my Republican colleagues, there just wasn't enough money to fund schools. Well, just what happened to private school funding with your tax dollars? This is state spending for private schools out of the Wisconsin state budget. There's that explosion again, which I don't have big speaker like these guys would have big speaker, but it said pow, all of a sudden. There's a whole bunch more money going to private schools. And you can see the steepness of that curve. And this goes all the way back to 1991, so this was happening under Tommy Thompson. But it was, it's got much, much steeper. This is a quote that came from my representative, Kathy Bernier, over in Chippewa Falls. She was at an event with the Eau Claire School District, and, and there was a question about Minnesota. And Minnesota's doing so well, and they have a surplus, and not so much in Wisconsin, and what's going on, and can't we learn from Minnesota? And Kathy Bernier got very upset and said that the school board person that asked that question was using hateful political speech, asking about Minnesota. And she got up and walked out of the meeting, saying that Wisconsin spent as much per student as Minnesota. And then she walked out. She wouldn't be there anymore, and she's very upset. What you can see here is that Wisconsin and Minnesota spend about the same, but whose pocket it comes out is, is very different. If you have gray hair, you may remember Tommy Thompson saying that about two, that our goal is to have two-thirds of the spending for schools coming out of the state and a third coming out of local property taxes. Well, that's exactly what's happening in, in Minnesota. Two-thirds is coming out of the state. The yellow is the state. One third is coming out of the local property taxes. But in Wisconsin, more money is coming out of local property taxes than the state. So think about this. Think about whose pocket it's coming out of. Who's more likely to have a, a, a fair tax system? The folks who, if we're relying on property taxes, or the state spending, which we're relying on income taxes. Most, 52% of our, our general funds come out of in, income taxes. So these are the same numbers, they just look a little different, but it shows you the 60-30 in Minnesota, the 45-48 in Wisconsin. And what happens? If the state cuts the spending, local people are strapped for, the local schools strapped for cash, and the local people say, hey, I don't want my school to close. I don't want to raise my property taxes, but I'm going to because I don't want my school to close. I think that's a band-aid. It's not solving the problem but it is absolutely necessary. And we can see all across the state that more and more referenda are passing because people do not want to lose their schools. They want their children and their grandchildren to be educated. I'm gonna show you a couple of graphs that are all from Department of Public Instruction um, data. And these are per by school district. So I'm gonna start a little bit over on my part of the state and, and just show you a story. Each one of these graphs tells a line in the story. So the first story is about the school district that has fewer students. So what we call enrollment dropping or we call it declining enrollment. This is Pepin. Pepin is on the west side of Wisconsin overlooking the beautiful Mississippi River. There's high property values but low income. You can, this is property tax here. This is state aid here. You can see that the Pepin School District is very highly property tax heavy. But you can also see how this is almost a straight line going down. State support in 2014, which is the most recent numbers I could get, is 60% lower. Yes. Here's the opposite situation in Prescott. Prescott, my, I, these are both in my district. Prescott, the folks think that the capital's vaguely in St. Paul. They, they're a 
suburb of St. Paul, south of Hastings, and that's why they don't know what's going on in Minnesota. And they know about Governor Dayton's big toe, but they forget that Scott Walker is our governor. God bless the folks in Prescott. They have a horrible story to tell. They have increasing enrollment, so you think that this slide should go from here up here, but it's not increasing fast enough. And right here is where the bomb dropped. The state aid dropped about 10%, which doesn't sound like a, a lot, but Prescott is in the very strange position right now of opening a new high school this coming fall and firing teachers because they can't afford them all. And they had a referendum that failed in February and they went back just a few weeks ago and passed a referendum but was only 20% of the original referendum. I talked with math teachers, business education te teachers, uh, career and technical t education teachers who are all losing their jobs because the state can't, or the, because the school district can't afford their, they can't afford to cover the costs of maintaining the buildings and paying for the teachers. This is Eau Claire. Eau Claire is obviously not rural, but I bring up Eau Claire because Eau Claire did have a drop of, of about a million and a half on a pretty big budget. It's about 13% drop in state aid, which is about what the statewide average was. So Eau Claire is actually increasing enrollment, although you don't see these numbers going up. They should be. Eau Claire has had increasing costs, so much so that they've spent down their savings account. They're going to referendum in November. They say if they do not pass the referendum, the school district will be bankrupt. And all I can say is, do you remember the story of Florence? Because there's no plan for the state for a, a school district that goes bankrupt, especially in this case, the eighth largest school district. This is Sturgeon Bay over in Door County. We see a big drop here where, where Act 10 happened, where the bomb dropped. 37% decrease that they still have hardly made up. This is Unity, this is in Polk County, this is around Balsam Lake. This is a very low aided district, but I have to say when I showed this to the Polk County people, they were shocked that state aid dropped 64% because of Act 10. And this is a district that voted for all Republicans. Shocking. Now we're getting to the neighborhood. This is Rhinelander. Rhinelander lost uh, about 11% of its enrollment over the time period that I'm looking at. 65% drop because of Act 10. So remember, the green is state aid, the, the pinkish is property tax. 66% drop between 2008 and 2014. And you can see very clearly how when there's not aid coming from the state, it gets made up in increased property tax. Oops, how did we do that? Oh dear. There is a button, yeah, which one is it? There we are. Thank you. Okay, this is the last slide. This is White Lake. This is the Lang Lake County. Is anybody from this area? Okay, so maybe. Yes, go ahead. Within two years, the state aid to the Rhinelander School District will be zero. Within two years, the state aid to the Rhinelander School District will be zero. And you can see, you can see the trend that Rhinelander's on. It's very, very sad. And then this is White Lake. White Lake is the worst situation. They've lost about 22% of their enrollment over seven years. And remember, the enrollment, the money from the state is tied to enrollment. State aid dropped 67% in just one year when Governor Walker dropped the bottom on schools. Right there, 67%. There's total state aid from 2008, nine, which would have been the last Governor Walker budget. Um, was, and you compare that to this 2014-15, was an 87% drop. So here, when you think about this, you can think that there are two twin Republican goals that are on a collision course. One is to privatize schools, and the second is to lower property taxes. And the Republicans think they can have both, and they can't. Because people are going to vote with their pocketbook to save their school, even if it means increasing their own property taxes. I'm going to 
you mention a little bit about the University of Wisconsin because I, I know everybody has heard a lot about it, but I think farm people don't always realize that the deep cuts to the University of Wisconsin also have an impact on rural Wisconsin even if you don't have a, a child in, in, in school or uh, a grandchild in school. Uh, because we're seeing massive changes in extension and I can't tell you how many people I ran into farm people who said, oh my gosh, you mean you cut the UW budget? Not me, but the Republicans. You cut the UW budget and, and it hurt extension? How does that work? You know what? The UW extension is part of the University of Wisconsin budget. So your local extension agent may not be there. The whole gardening pro uh, garden master gardener program may not be there. 4-H may not be there. The county fair may not be there the way we know it. If we're going to continue cuts to the University of Wisconsin. Oh, also, my Republican colleagues say, well, we couldn't pay for schools, because we couldn't fund the UW because we had to pay down the debt. How's that working? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a bit of a story to tell you about the debt. Um, the governor just last week decided that he was not going to pay a debt bill coming due. So. This number, uh, this is 2015, I don't have the 2016 number because it's not official, but it will be in a couple weeks and I'll give you another, I'll put another line on my graph that'll take us back up here. Probably it'll be close to the largest debt the state has ever had under Governor Walker. But what else is happening is the governors of both political stripes are not paying bills coming due. Now I'm an organic farmer in western Wisconsin, my husband and I have an organic farm. We raise hay for organic dairy farmers and other, other crops. Uh, we pay our mortgage once a year. Imagine if I went to my banker and said, I don't want to pay my mortgage. And he would say to me, well, Kathleen, look, you know, if you don't want to pay your mortgage, that's fine, but it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you in principle and it's going to cost you in interest. That's exactly what's happening at the state of Wisconsin. These numbers, which go up into the 500 and 600 million range here, are debt bills that are coming due to be paid. It's like a mortgage bill coming due to be paid. And they were not paid for the sole purpose of being able to keep that cash to pay other bills. Which is a red flag, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, if you're a good Norwegian fiscal conservative, it's a red flag. And it's something that I think we need to talk more about. So think about this. More money in the budget was the first slide I showed you. Cuts to schools, cuts to the UW, doesn't pay off the debt, but there's billions more being spent. What the heck is going on? Well, first of all, it's important to remember that the state is actually in the black. We are expected to grow 4%, a little over 4% this year. This is the revenue line. So this is the money that's coming in from all different types of taxes. This here is Bush recession number one, 2001. This is Bush recession number two that Obama inherited. This little flat spot is actually Act 10, had an effect on the state's revenue. The next slide I'm going to show you is the beginning checkbook balance going all the way back to 1993. So this is zero. This is the beginning. This is in the black. This is the beginning in the red. Negative numbers in the checkbook. Bat, in the checkbook, Starting in 1993 by fiscal year, by every single year here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that money line, the amount of money coming into the state, and I'm going to lie it across the beginning checkbook balance because I think it tells an interesting story about money. All right, that's to wake you up there. <laughs> this is... Bush, George Bush recession number one. For those folks that have gray hair, you remember the stories of Tommy Thompson and why he went to Washington? This is why he went to Washington. Rumors were Tommy Thompson was spending like a drunken sailor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was. So this is when Senator Holford and I were in the legislature and George Bush recession number two dropped the bottom out of our state's finances and all the rest of the states across the country. You can see that even though it was a much deeper recession, 
You can see that the state managed to keep its balance, its books balance. We did it three ways. We took money from the feds when they offered us money. Imagine that. <laughs> we cut back on programs. And if there's any Bernie Sanders people in the room, you will appreciate that. We taxed the top 1% before it was popular. Don't tell the press folks there. They'll have a lit piece on me, the Republicans, before I leave town. <laughs> but here was the end of, of Governor Doyle's term and the last budget that the Democrats voted on. So this was the recession. This was Governor Walker's first year. This was his second year. So he, the, he and the Repu and if you remember 2010, I was on the ballot in 2010, and what we heard from the Republicans over and over again was we're going to cut five billion out of state government. And I kept saying, oh my God, if you cut five billion out of state government, you know what the state's going to look like. Well, they didn't cut five billion out of state government. In fact, all of the money that the Democrats raised, they spent, and they spent it in the next year, and then they spent more than they had, and then they spent more than they had. So the opening balance going into this budget was the worst that it's ever been in history because of all of the spending that was greater than money coming in. It seems, how shall we say, not the story that you hear when the governor comes to Rhinelander. There is another story to tell, and that is the story about the money that does not come into the state treasury because of business tax credits. This, most of these business tax credits are run through the WEDC, Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. There's now been four economic development audits over the last several years. They all tell the same story. These business tax credits that have been claimed, and this is claimed, claimed tax credits by fiscal year, the WEDC has not been able to verify that there has been one job created from these tax credits that were given. Not one. They have not independently gone in to find out that these companies that have gotten these tax credits have actually done what they said they were going to do. And the tax credits can be claimed over a 15 to 20 year period. So even if we stop them all tomorrow, they're still going to go, this line's going to go like this. Oh my God. Over the next 15 to 20 years. Even if we do nothing, even if we give away no more money to folks that are not doing what they promised. Uh, this is a quote from Warren Petrick, my representative over in western Wisconsin, who's a Republican. He was at a meeting with me in Ellsworth at the, the end of March, and he said the next budget is going to be very challenging. Medicaid took every dollar. What I heard, and these are my thoughts, not his, all those poor people are sucking up your dollars, so we can't put the money into schools. It's out of our hands. We didn't have anything we could do or say about it. The feds made us do it. Well, I think there, and you know, there's a message that sells out there, and, and they're on to something with this. It's the sort of divide the poor people against the near poor people. It's true, though. You know it's true. So this is the state budget. I know you can't see all these numbers, but the top one is health. And indeed, health is growing faster than anything else. The largest part, this is all funds, so this is federal funds as well as state. It's growing faster than any other part of the budget, and it's the largest part of the budget when you can skip, consider the federal funds. I'm going to blow up just this part right here, since the governor took office. Since the governor took office, the, there are three billion, with a B, new spending in Medicaid, and only 20,000 new people have been covered. So something is going on, and this is one thing I think Republicans and Democrats can agree on, that the, there's something going on, but nobody wants to open that black box that's called Medicaid. And I think this is one of the reasons why. These are dollars going to private contractors to do the money of running the state program that state workers used to do. To give you a feel for what this means, I talked with a person who worked for the Department of Health and she does coding. So if your grandson breaks his arm and you go into the emergency room and, and the grandson is on Medicaid, that coder writes in that code and that's how the doctor gets paid. Well, she said that her coding her work 
She gets paid, and when you consider it on an hourly basis, the state pays about $35 an hour for her. The private contractor, the state pays about $235 an hour, and she said, oh, and they're terrible at it, we have to do all kinds of repairs to all their numbers because they just can't get it right. Well, here is a really good example of where we need, why we need to take off, of, take off the top of the black box of Medicaid, look inside and figure out how to do a better way of running the program. This is 2011 when the governor took over. You can see the steep climb and then a steep climb here and the amount of money going to those private companies. But I have to tell you that the guys who get this money, they play on both sides and they get big donations to both the current governor and the past governor. The other thing that I think needs to be thought about is to take the money from the federal government to cover Medicaid. This is a no-brainer, I have to tell you. When I went and gave this similar presentation to the school board over in Prescott, this is a very Republican school board, um, very conservative. They, um, school board president, I've been there for 20 years, Tea Party school board president. And I told him this, and I said, we could, we could get $400 million in cash in the next budget and cover 83,000 people if we would just take the money from under the Affordable Care Act and expand Medicaid. And he said, well, that's a no-brainer. <laughs> <laughs> so think about it. I'm, I'm giving you ammunition to use in your next letter to the editor or next time you talk over the fence to that Republican or at the, at the gathering at the... Fourth of July chicken festival. You know, there's all kinds of little things that you can bring up that you can say that, that'll get those folks saying, really? Oh my gosh. And you need any more data, I'll give it to you. <laughs> so I believe this is mismanagement. And, and there, there is a way to solve the problem, so this is part of the solution. You, you may have a friend who's disabled, who's a frail elderly person, a person on something called family care or senior care. These programs, especially family care and a program called IRIS, are being changed dramatically. There's probably going to be a vote in the next couple of weeks in Madison in the, on the Joint Finance Committee to take this program and turn it into a, a very, one, one or two or maybe three insurance companies and shut down what we call the managed care organizations, which are nonprofit entities that started off as being county run. I, I think this is done for political reasons and there was a fiscal bureau report, report that came out just this week that said that all of the savings that the governor is saying might come from changing this program over, well let's say they had concerns about whether or not any of it would materialize. <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about natural resources when we talk about choices that the budget that the governor could have made there's a quote here, and I'll kind of paraphrase it from the governor. On Earth Day, the governor gave 57 Department of Natural Resources employees their pink slips. Only one of those positions was funded with state money. The rest of it was either funded through fees or funded through federal dollars. And the governor basically said, um, we'll do the research for, for DNR on an as-needed basis, and when we do, we'll contract for it. All I could think of was the deer czar from Texas. <laughs> and, and you know a little bit about the state parks? You may have heard that the governor is going to sell off 10,000 acres of state land by this coming summer, so a summer from now. I would say watch your state parks carefully. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about transportation. Um, there was, transportation was in the news this week. Um, there, the transportation fund doesn't cover enough of the money. There's more money going out than there's money coming into the transportation fund. And the governor proposed in the last budget massive amounts of borrowing. The Republicans backed him down a little bit. This week he said he's not going to raise any fees, he's not going to raise any taxes, he's not going to change any of the money coming in, which means he only can increase the borrowing or stop some of the programs some of the building. Um, there's a statewide bipartisan coalition that's being put together this summer to have a public discussion about roads and about who's going to pay for them and I'm going to guess it's going to come to Rhinelander. And all of the candidates that are here, 
need to think about what they want to say because the folks that are the road builders, the engineers, the people, the, the towns association, the counties are all saying, hey, if we can't get the governor to change his mind, maybe we can get the candidates to help the governor change his mind. And their, their, their vision is to have a discussion about this this summer. Um, we just had a report that came out a few weeks ago that said 42% of Wisconsin's major local and state maintained roads are in poor to mediocre condition. In the last budget, Republican Secretary of Transportation came up with 24 different ways to change the money coming into the Department of Revenue. One of them, I think, is another no-brainer. You may not know it. I didn't know it until I read his report. Wisconsin has 717 miles of state-owned railroad. State-owned railroad. Did you know as a taxpayer you, were, you had ownership in 717 miles of railroad? Well, the, the program that, to help pay for the railroads was a meager $10 per car load for those companies using statewide railroad. Instead, this did not pass, instead, $44 million in new borrowing went to upkeep that railroad that we all own. Which doesn't make any sense to me at all. So what different choices might we have made? This is a list of all of the things that Tony Evers, the superintendent of public instruction, and here's his picture, Tony, he has put in his budget. He has put all of these changes that would address the problems in schools, including changing the funding system right here. He put this in his budget in 2011. He put it in the budget in 2013. He put it in the budget in 2015. In every case, the governor took it out of the budget and we couldn't get enough votes in the, in the Senate and the Assembly to put it back in the budget. The problems I have talked about related to property taxes in schools are solvable, but we have to have the votes to get it done. To show this, I put together a budget, and I know you can't see this, I actually put together three budgets, just like Tony, in 11 and 13 and 15, but, and these are all the things I would not have buy, bought. I hope you're not a Bucks fan. I would have not bought the Bucks Stadium. <laughs> not a good idea. <laughs> Fully funding Medicaid, getting rid of the expansion on private schools with tax dollars, getting rid of some of these tax credits. Do you know there is a, in addition to all the money going into private schools through the budget, there's also a, a $60 million private school tax credit that it's taking away tax money. So this is funding schools, this is funding the UW, this is funding another, uh, a number of other important programs including public radio and public television. Department of Natural Resources, uh, like I said, that wouldn't cost very much because most of it's federal money. And I ended with a, oops, I ended with a billion dollar surplus, which is this. Compare that to the governor's 800 million in the hole. So all of this is to say, we care about our community. We care about what Rhinelander looks like. We care about the future for our children and our grandchildren. And what happens in the capital has a direct impact on what happens in your community. And I don't think there's a stronger argument than to say what those folks are doing down there is hurting us right here and it's hurting the world that our grandchildren are going to live in. And by the end, we got to change it. Thank you very much. So maybe while we're 
having dinner and we can pass around the list and if you want me to um, send you the presentation I will send it to you either by email or by snail mail whatever works better for you just write it so that I can read your email because you know one letter will make a difference the other thing I would offer it to you I know some folks have asked me about the column that I write I live in Western Wisconsin there are 24 weekly newspapers in my column in my district I, I write a 700 word column a week uh, talking about what's going on in Madison, I try to get the word out to the rural people about what's happening because of course we don't know. And if you want to be on that list, um, just put a little note and say add me to your column list or we'll put a little note at the top and I'll get a sign up sheet started. So everybody that wants to have the presentation or be in the column list, just make sure you sign before you leave. And we'll pass it around. Okay? Thank you everyone and we're going to take a brief break and we're going to have an opportunity to eat and then in about 45 minutes or so we're going to hear from the candidates that are here and a couple of them have spokespeople that they sent and hopefully before you go home you'll have a chance to talk to all, all of them. Thank you very much.